Today we are very fortunate to be joined by Nick Wool, uh, and Nick has come with, to us uh, today from the University of Arizona uh, in Tucson, uh, where he has been located for the last 36 years working as an astronomer and astrobiologist. Uh, Nick got a, a BSc and a PhD uh, at the University of Manchester before he came over to the States. Uh, he is uh, best known in his career as an astronomer for the identification of uh, silicates being ejected from red giant stars uh, and how that may be seeding uh, the interplanetary medium with silicates. He has been the director of the University of Minnesota Observatories uh, and currently he's the PI for the University of Arizona Astrobiology Unit. <coughs> And uh, in that uh, capacity, he's going to talk to us today about uh, aspects regarding the origin of life. So if you'll join me in welcoming him. Thank you. Fifty years ago, I was a postdoc up at Lick Observatory, and uh, Carl Sagan was a postdoc with Lederberg at Stanford. Carl came up to visit us and gave us a talk about looking at on Earth at one kilometer resolution and looking down from space. We're all on 25 years, and uh, in the mid-1980s, I was working with Roger Angel. We were developing concepts for terrestrial planet finders, uh, devices not only to image planets, but to look for life by seeking signs of both habitability from the presence of water and carbon dioxide and the presence of oxygen in the form of ozone as an indicator of, of uh, uh, oxygenic photosynthesis having occurred there. I'm here 25 years after that to tell you that all that time I haven't known what life was, what I was looking for, therefore. And uh, so it's about time that I came and talked to you about uh, what life is and uh, how that must have determined how it formed. To start this off, you're going to have to suffer an indignity. You're going to have to suffer having someone who was trained in physics and astronomy tell you the difference between biology and chemistry. The distinction is this. In chemistry, you have a very simple situation, usually. You have, uh, you have, have groups that interact with one another, things like hydroxyl, uh, or uh, hydrogen, and you can say, okay, so now I understand. You have a, an acid plus a base, and it produces a salt plus water. All that is very, very simple. Once you start to get to the chemistry of the carbon atom, everything gets suddenly messed up, because carbon sticks to carbon in all kinds of different ways, produces a great many varieties of compound with the same uh, functional group on them, and indeed uh, sometimes multiple functional groups. And therefore, uh, the possibilities are very much greater, the opportunities are very much greater, but there's a terrible problem in selecting what is attached to what and where. And life does this with enzymes, which are uh, molecules that have a particular shape. And by having one kind of shape, they act as uh, <coughs> keys to attach to the inverse shape that is found on the particular molecule. So instead of selecting a molecule by functional group, you're selecting a molecule by shape. And the way that the whole process works is that the whole system is vibrating thermally, it's a Brownian motion, and, uh, and when, uh, when molecules bump together, they sort of rattle around and find out whether they can or can't fit, and if they can fit, they stick, 
And if two stick in the right orientation, and there's an opportunity for them to come together, as like this, you can go from uh, the right to the left. Uh, there are the two bits. You can see how they, they fit in the middle, and then on the left, the joint pieces go off. The problem for this in the origin of life is that although the complicated carbon compounds are there, you haven't got the enzymes. You haven't got anything that can recognize a shape. And, uh, and this presents a huge difficulty for the development of carbon chemistry. So, before I go further, I, I'd like to introduce you to the, the things that have driven me along a particular direction in, in trying to understand what life is, um, so that you can see if you can wiggle out of the path that I have, uh, have at least I think I've been driven down. First of all, there are arguments arising that, that, that life arose as a dynamic process driven by an external energy flow. Mm. Secondly, that there was a need for incremental development without genetic help. And thirdly, that there is an ambivalent relationship between the molecules of life and water. In fact, between all kinds of life and water. Uh, we can't live without water, but if you dunk us in water for a period of Time, we're dead. So um, we, we too have an ambivalent relationship with water. So the sequence of the talk is, first of all, the puzzle of how life got organized, which moved to the classification of life as a system, that curious relationship with water, the odd elements of life, why phosphorus, why nitrogen, the thing about survival, that it's set by structure, not information, and yet we see life as characterized by information. And so those leading to the origins of structure, genetic code, and enzyme. So life is organized, how did it happen? A big enough mess does not self-organize, at least not in my office. Uh, and I've made some pretty big messes in my office. You might wonder why it doesn't organize, why it doesn't self-organize. The answer is, if you try to organize your office, and I have occasionally tried it, it takes work. You have to actually put energy into the system to move things into the right places. And uh, yet, when you think about organization, it is a kind of order that corresponds to cooling. It is, uh, it, if you try and, uh, and produce order, it's the equivalent of moving heat from a cold object to a hot one. So it, it uses energy to do it. And it's this use of energy that is uh, part of the problem. When I was, was a kid, we had an Electrolux refrigerator. I don't know whether any of you have ever seen one of these things, but they have a little gas flame in one corner and a place where, where heat comes off somewhere else. And it drives material around in a cycle, and in that cycle there's cooling produced, and the cooling actually uh, keeps the refrigerator cold. There's no moving parts. Actually, Einstein invented one of the varieties of, of this device, but it does indeed take, uh, take a heat flow to produce kind of order, and that is the start of, of the drama that I'm looking at. So, I'm not the only person that's tried to uh, say what life is. Uh, 2002, Carol Cleland and, and Chris Chiber uh, tried to define life, and uh, when they were unable to, they, they decided that what they needed was some kind of comparison, something that they could define so that they could show what they wanted. And so they said, here's water. And there was a time when people didn't quite know what water was, but now we know what it is. It's H2O. What I'm going to say is that they didn't define it. They classified it. Water is of the general class of molecules. 
and it has specific features. Only hydrogen and oxygen, no atomic ratio of 2 to 1. System study has to begin with classifications, and I think that they were right. But they then should have said what we needed to do was to classify life. And you notice that the classification has two parts. There's a generic form to which the thing has to belong. There are a variety of generic forms, and you try and, and narrow down your generic form. And I'm not going to worry about that aspect here. And that generic is the genus of, of the form. And then there's a specific form, the details of the form, so that the generic uh, form was molecules, and then the specific or species forms were hydrogen oxygen and two to one ratio. In contrast to that, the best definition that they had available, and still is the best we have available from Jerry Joyce, life is a self-sustained chemical system capable of undergoing Darwinian evolution. I have a number of complaints about it. First of all, the definition doesn't classify, it doesn't give a genus, nor does it give the specific of life. Um, secondly, that life is self-sustained, then why does man in space need a life support system? It's obviously not self-sustained, it is at least in part environment sustained. <coughs> Chemical description of subsystems, really. Chemistry is the study of parts, not holes. And as uh, Steve Brenner pointed out to me, any form of evolution that works may keep a system surviving. And currently, we are a technological society, and our technology developed as a Lamarckian process, not a Darwinian one, so any form of evolution will work. Now, you shouldn't complain about anybody else's work unless you offer an alternative. Um, so, uh, a year ago, with a group of friends, uh, we did write a paper proposing a classification framework in the uh, journal Foundations of Science, framework linking non-living and living systems, classification of persistence, survival, and evolution transitions. The word survival has entered here for the first time. And, uh, we noticed that Darwin uh, recognized that the one absolute requirement for life was survival. But somehow, in the attempt to define life or classify it, the word survival seemed to get missed. And that it ought to be driving what we're doing. And the purpose of that classification, as you can see, was to apply to topics like the origin of life or the search for life beyond the earth. And so, I'm going to the first of those today. Here is a classification. I'm not going to say it's an ideal one, but at least a starting one. Life is a survival system that operates in some non-equilibrium environment. It uses environmental energy and matter to build, repair, reproduce itself by memory-controlled precision assembly. And it goes through the bits of that. First of all, a survival system that operates in some non-equilibrium environment, that is the energy flow part, and it's what's called a dissipative system. Um, Prigogine described the thermodynamics of systems divided between two kinds of systems, closed systems and open systems. Closed systems are <coughs> conservation of energy, and the second law of thermodynamics applies open systems, energy flows through, order can grow, that is, entropy can decrease, and therefore life is into this class of dissipative systems. What else do we find in this class? Well, we find hurricanes, forest fires, zircons, and that wonderful swirling motion as water goes down the drain. Uh, these are all the same generic form, they're different, special uh, aspects. All of them use energy flow for the continuity, and that in life is called metabolism. Some spawn crude copies. They even have reproduction. Hurricanes <coughs> can spawn smaller hurricanes. Forest fires can easily start additional forest fires. Zircons 
break into parts and those parts grow separately, so on. But life is unique in its precision copying, that precision that had to define how those enzymes were. And so that is its species characteristic. In order to go a little further, let's look at one of the alternatives, a zircon. This is a picture of a zircon. They're about a fraction of a millimeter across. They're little tiny crystals. And uh, what you can see on this one is that there's an unconformity here. The structure has layered that way, and then suddenly a new layering appears in another direction. There was formerly something over here. There was formerly something larger that got broken. Zircons are zirconium silicate crystals. They're born, if you will, or grow, both. They grow layers in magma pools, pools of hot rock, when crustal rock is subducted and it's heated up. At the surface, when it comes back up again, uh, crystals form part of magmatic rock. Earth processes erode them, move them, form them into sedimentary rock. Some are totally destroyed in the process, so there's a growth and repair uh, through the, the part where new layers are added. The earth flow nurtures zircons. It carries them through a complete life cycle. And I want you to think about this because this is something that is in some way similar to life in, uh, and the order of in which processes grow is, is from the generic to the more complex. Um, in order perhaps to explain that a little better, let me give you an example. There were no agricultural communities before there was agriculture. Once there were agricultural communities, it was possible to develop city-states. Once city-states existed, it was possible to link them together as an empire. So order grows up. And so if one goes back to the generic, the simplest kind of order, that is what one has to expect to find at the start and to expect to see it growing. So there's our zircon crystal again. And you can see all kinds of things having happened to it. It still kept uh, growing. Uh, new pieces and was carried through and some lived, some died, many ways reminiscent of life. So there are two parts in this development process. The first is that which happened to the zircon, nurture, the initial provision of environmental energy, matter, and being carried through a cycle. The next part is the learning part, and it's the the getting of information, but we'll leave that till further on. Okay, so how would proto-life differ from zircons? First of all, the medium for proto-life would be water rather than rock. Water actually will drive some molecules into lumps. Oil doesn't mix with water, uh, so uh, and soapy materials will, will actually form boundaries between oil and water. Uh, equally, water seems to be useful, and it, re it re releases some <coughs> ingredients from meteorites that seem to be necessary for life. Bubbling hot water will break up weak protoorganisms. And this is part of a general repetitive process, as with the zircon, repetitive processes are necessary to keep the system going. But if you move the pieces produced by a repetitive process, you can take organic chemistry to completion even if you haven't got a way of selecting other than selecting the product at the end. So that second part of life uses environmental energy and matter to build, repair, reproduce itself by memory control, precision assembly. You can see I've used two different colors there, blue and red. Build and repair are, are words that go along with metabolism. They are 
They are the way that, uh, that stuff happens to the zircon too. Uh, New zirconium silicate is, uh, is, is added on, it builds, repairs, and so on. On the other hand, memory is clearly a, uh, an information system. And when you look at these words, you can see that the word precision is, is the real uh, problem one. It, it is where information has got into the system, and metabolism and genetic processes have got thoroughly mixed together in this process. And this is why life seems to be so different from these other kinds of processes. We don't have just uh, an ordinary metabolic process going, but we have one that mixed up with genetic aspects in, in that the enzymes have to be produced by a genetic process. So, for 20 years, the origin of life has been like a town hall meeting and half say, survival is urgent, we have to do something. And the, the, those people are called metabolism first. And the other half say, first we've got to get organized, and they're the RNA world. And uh, here we're going to consider a bootstrap combination. But I'd like to, to pause for a moment and think, if these things are indeed being carried around by a flow, a cyclic process, Survival is not urgent. It's possible to do something else as well. And that flow process is already organization. So it is indeed possible to get something done and, uh, and get more organized without intruding on the other process. And that's what I'm going to try and do. Now, the RNA world concept came from Walter Gilbert in 1986. Uh, and I'm going to suggest that some things, proteins and lipids, were missing from his concept of the world and need to be added back. Freeman Dyson noted in his book that the emphasis on viruses uh, for studying genetic development omitted the crucial role of structure in the origin of life. Viruses don't need structure because they borrow somebody else's structure and, and work with it. Uh, yes, RNA initially satisfied some roles of enzymes and being depositive. <coughs> but when you think that phages are parasites, even they have a protein coat because RNA is so reactive. You have to keep the RNA from reacting with anything until it gets into the cell, so you cover it with protein to protect it. And some of the, the phages even have a lipid coat as well. So uh, lipids do seem to be somewhere in the process, and, uh, and therefore we might well expect an RNA plus protein plus lipid world. Though there are going to be limitations on the kinds of proteins that could have been there. So we're looking for this bootstrap origin of life and we start off with the things that are there, like for the zircons, there's a structure, and then there's selection of zirconium silicate, and it gets added together. But in life, there's something more. The gluing together of molecular pieces to make polymers. And that had to develop next, somehow. And then there, the selection of what to glue led to a, a a fourth process of copying. And it is the sequence of going from the structure and select, then gluing, then copying, that was necessary for the origin of life. <coughs> so, how does life keep going today? Well, there's a precision assembly. It's the shape of a molecule selected and it's glued to another and so on. We produce polymers. And then there's the device that produces this selection and gluing, and that has to exactly copy itself. But then the selection for survival comes not from the thing that does the selecting gluing, but from the structure. Structure gets selected, and because the structure is one that has this selecting glue process in it, that's how the selecting glue piece managed to be retained. 
it's the interaction between the, the structural and the informational parts that has kept the system going. And you can't get away with just one. So, I'm now going to start having to move towards reality, and, uh, and I'm led into certain uh, directions. First of all, simple life has difficulty in colonizing a very different environment. Simply that, uh, simple life is very environment dependent, and birth environment is unlike space. So it's unlikely that life came from elsewhere. The second is that the reactions that produce uh, life-like materials, the Miller-Urey reactions, don't work in the carbon dioxide rich atmosphere, and that's what we had early Earth. On the other hand, they do act in space, and that's why meteoritic materials are like the products of the Miller-Urey experiment, and they could accumulate on the surface of the Earth, but they get lost in oceans. So I'm sort of led to look for a surface of Earth uh, origin for, uh, for life. Needed materials, first of all, there's water with its pros and cons, there's a lipid used to make membranes, <coughs> amino acids used to make protein structures and catalysts. There are three things, nuclear bases, phosphates, and ribose sugar that are put together to make nucleic acid, and they each have their different roles. The nuclear bases guide the action to the appropriate place. The phosphates transfer condensation reaction energy, they are linkers, and ribose sugar provides OH to initiate some condensation reactions. I'm going to have to tell you more about condensation reactions. They just had to come in here. Okay. So, the pros and cons of water are that water nurtures proto-life, it releases needed materials, but it attacks the needed materials. See, Bella explained that to me. Can materials be hidden from attack? If so, how? Well, here some locals uh, are telling us that the answer is obviously yes, uh, that uh, soap-like materials will indeed form layers or, or little round lumps, and if they form these two-layered structures, <coughs> we have over here, then there is an oily material between, and the water doesn't get in here. And those little egg-like things are hydroxyl, OH, and those, are, those form the boundary with the water, and, uh, and it is interesting because that boundary indeed is where things with OH bonded to it will then tend to stick even if they're trying to hide away from the water and so they, they are more vulnerable the more OH there is around. Next to why phosphorus? Phosphoric acid can by loss of water be attached as a metastable unit then it becomes HPO3 and it will contribute its binding energy when it's detached and it will also take up water so You've got a glue, something that can energize reactions, take up the water formed by the reactions, and so drive reactions to happen. Nitrogen. Well, oxygen, carbon, nitrogen, and next to hydrogen, the most abundant active elements. And of these, nitrogen is the weakest bound to hydrogen. So if you're going to go need to grab a hydrogen, the easiest place to grab it from is nitrogen. It's about five or six percent easier than trying to get it from uh, from carbon, and a lot easier than trying to break an, an OH bond. So nitrogen provides uh, a, 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 an easy place to glue. It's like a site at which sort of gluing a molecule together will happen. And the first process is the condensation reaction. It explains how structures of chemicals are put together, they are put together and linked by the elimination of water. Here it is, um, three examples, 
amino acids linked together. Uh, they have an OH at one end and an H linked to nitrogen at the other. And so if an OH and an H are put together, they go off as water and the linked piece becomes uh, a small uh, protein uh, structure that can then get further linked. Um, the condensation reactions link uh, bases to ribose to phosphate, and those are uh, for the nucleic acids. And then phosphate linked to a phosphate, again, energizes. The condensation reaction, the relationship with water, is crucial to the reactions of life. So, the molecules that don't like water stay apart from it. The uh, ones that like water mix with it, often dissolve in it. The lipids have part to do both. And the condensation reactions allow molecules to hide inside lipid coats. So, now we come to finding the source of the materials. And this is a picture of a piece of Murchison meteorite, which is a carbonaceous chondrite and it has the following aspects. The material of the Murchison liberates lipids, these soap -like materials, if you just put it in hot water. It has amino acids in it. Not only does it have amino acids in it, but they are chiral, that is, they have a handedness, uh, not uh, totally, but at least partially. And Murchison has these nucleic bases. The other parts, the phosphate, and the ribose are a little trickier. It's not clear that we really know how they arose, but iron meteorites have nickel iron phosphide, which can be transformed into soluble phosphate. And ribose could form from formaldehyde if that got to Earth, if it managed to stay together, and if there were borates in the place where it was. A lot of ifs there. Maybe ribose arose that way, maybe some other way. Okay, there's the materials. How can change occur? How can something that is like this steadily drift from being one kind of thing to something else? First of all, the ingredients must have dual roles. The first role that they have is the one that gets selected and carried along. The second role creates a new opportunity and serves as the next selection basis. And so you can see these drivers as they come into play. First of all, protection of the material from water. But that only works if the structures in which they are survive. So the structures have to be made better. And then when the structures are made better, they start kicking out new material. So you have to start have developing ways of bringing materials in. Each of these things drives the process forward. The initial condensation reactions were random. They can strengthen membrane, but they have no information adding role. There might be a, a transfer, something that had some kind of selection, selecting molecules that like water, molecules that didn't like water. That allowed the first information process to develop. As I said, the ribose is helpful, particularly in allowing the uh, selecting bases to connect with the phosphate, uh, and, and uh, equally having further OHs that would help more condensation reactions uh, add together. So going through, first of all, the lipids extracted by hot water were externally driven by, to cohesion by the water itself. Next, there was a self-adhesive cohesion. As uh, you get hot bo boiling water or even hotter under pressure, you can in fact get condensation reactions to occur by themselves. So then you had a further process developing um, when the phosphate added to ribose to the base, however that happened, then there was selective cohesion. You could decide what to add to what, and so on. So, 
what did this selecting ad do? First of all, for the lipids, uh, and I, I, Jack Shostak showed how this works. There's a movement, first of all, that single chain lipids develop by condensation reactions into double chains. That is, like the ones that I was showing you in the picture, there were two lines of the oily substance. And then they become phospholipids. Now, by the time phospholipids lipids start being added, these molecules are really good at keeping out water. And as a result, when the materials get added, water doesn't get added on the inside. So you can't make nice balloons with the structures. They have to stay small in volume. They become sausage-shaped. With sausage-shaped structures, sausage-shaped breaking too. And so you actually get the, the first division. The next part is that, that adding uh, hydrophobic amino acids to hydrophobic ones, the one the inside the layer, and hydrophilic to hydrophilic outside, and then making a link across, you make crude transmembrane proteins. They're not, they're not alpha helices. They don't have the same chirality, but they do indeed go across the structure, they're likely to be driven together by being somewhat more water tolerant, and so you get bundles of them, just as you get bundles of alpha helices in the structures that cross membranes today. And the third part that you might expect is that linked amino acids could make crude rigidization, cytoskeleton, rigidize the membrane so that when you do bring more material in, you're still going to have this sausage-like behavior and uh, expect that you will get, get uh, division to occur. There are the multiple roles. The nucleic acid, when phosphorylated, can perform condensation reactions. It can select and glue amino acids. It can copy itself, connected to brownian vibration catalysts and enzymes. <coughs> ribozymes are called, but it can't make structures too reactive. The amine, here it is actually. The pieces, you can see both as the glue, there's the HPO3, there is the sugar with its OHs, and there is a base, but equally in this RNA polymer, there is the base, the sugar, and the, and, and the phosphate and they, they link together with the, the sugar forming the intermediary between the phosphate and the base because it's needed for its OH. The amino acids are ideal building blocks. The OH at one end, NH at the other. Just great for taking the H at one and putting it with the OH. The water goes off and you've linked already. There it is. The each at one end, or each at the other. They're good for structures. They're good for Brownian vibration catalysts, the later development. Uh, but they're not good for copying. This is this is the thing pointed out by, by uh, Watson and Crick that uh, proteins just have no mechanism for copying. So the copying requires the nucleic acids. And the structure requires the amino acids, and that's why you have to develop both together. Now, say, so how do you make a transition to code? Well, code has to develop step by step selection process, additional selection process, and so on. So, first, there had to be just a choice between two bases. I'm going to suggest there was a sequence two bases, two steps. And it's a third, and then a fourth base in two steps, and finally got to our code as we know it today. The development is rather like the development of organization skills for a child. You will have a child who will know that when they learn to talk, they develop a favorite word, and it is totally common and seems to come without any effort. They learn to say no. And, uh, this is because it has the greatest effect on doing something. And in the same way, uh, that choice, that first word, the decision, 
Now, is it hydrophobic or hydrophilic? Have to come. Uh, if you've only got those choices, your next uh, your next option is you can only repeat them in different forms. You find that there are four four forms, so you, you've got four options: no, stop, yes, and start. Uh, if you think of it as no is hydrophobic and yes is hydrophilic, then, then that's what the four pieces would be, and you would develop a code that works like this. There would be U selects hydrophobic material, A selects hydrophilic, when you add on the second letter, you'll see that you've got a stop here and a start there, and if you go to the code as we've got it today, you will see that indeed that is where the stop appears, and unfortunately this doesn't show it, but where the methionine shown here, that acts as the start in the same way. Of course, uracil is a, a nasty base. It doesn't select very nicely. It sometimes selects guanine instead of adenine, and that added a third letter, and you can see that when it added it, it kept stop apparently in the same equivalent position. Uh, it actually kept a hydrophobic material down here, but uh, in the process you started to add new option for an amino acid. Uh, GG allows glycine to come in. And then when we had all four of the bases and a two-letter code, you could see that you had got quite a range of amino acids available, and this must have been how the genetic code got to uh, to that stage, and finally, when it needed more amino acids, uh, then it had to add a, a third uh, letter. So, how could the, men, the first enzymes have arisen in this process? Molecules lock to the enzyme surface, and the lock property required at least four atoms per radian of surface. If you look, look at that thing, it, it's hard to describe it, but if you Think of a, a Yale key. You've got to have at least four bumps on it to make it a useful Yale key. And uh, when you've done that, you ask, what kind of structure have you made? You find you've got something with something like 250 atoms put together, of which 200 are sitting on the surface. And there are three ways of making a structure like that. You can make it atom by atom, amino acid by amino acid, or nucleic acid by nucleic acid. Okay, if we randomly make a 250-atom molecule from carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and phosphorus, it turns out there are 10 to the 175 varieties. You make it, it turns out to be the right one that does the job, but you have absolutely no way of getting the process to happen again. If you make it from the 20 amino acid varieties with their two chiralities, you find that there are more than 10 to the 22 varieties of result that could be produced, but as Watson and Crick stated, the central dogma said you can't reproduce it. You have no way it happened by chance. You can't go back. However, if you make it with nucleic acids, they have about 50 atoms together, so it only takes five nucleic acids to be stuck together. And uh, it would, of course, at the start have two ribose chiralities, uh, and in all there are 30,000 variants. Not a terribly large number. And if you selected one, you've got nucleic acids which can make their copies by code, anti-code, produce this code again, and so you can produce it again. And so nucleic acids are by far the most likely way to make the first enzyme. And this is the part of the RNA world that had to be absolutely correct. Recently, Rebecca from Turk at the Yaris lab found a five nucleotide enzyme with G at the end. And such an enzyme, once formed, would both copy and mutate. It would help to produce amino acid structures with their variable survival, and that would then select a particular enzyme. What we've done is we have made a transition to genetic evolution, and that is the key part of, of, 
our understanding of life. We understand how the genetic part works. We, once we've got into genes, we can carry the process forward. It's that process between genes. There's nothing organized, and suddenly there are genes and enzymes there that makes all the difference. So, if you will, going back on our selection, we had to go through stock and start, had to develop four bases, had to have genetics enter by having uh, having small RNA enzymes with code and anti-code. We got copying of those and we got selection. Only a 10 amino acid group, but it's enough to get going. And an RNA and protein and lipid world could begin. Application to an early Earth environment. Well, the early Earth was cold and frozen. I know it got hot at one point, but apparently it cooled off incredibly rapidly. The ground was wet, but the top it's likely to have been frozen. The heat flow, the radioactivity was about three times what it is at present. And currently there are 10 hot spring areas at the surface of the Earth with geysers. And I'm going to assume that it must have been rather similar then. The inflow of interplanetary material, those uh, carbonaceous chondrite material, uh, is somewhere between 10 and 1,000 times what we have at present. It's plausible that some of the material was preserved on ice, and then when water got around, it could have sloshed the stuff back into the hot springs and been available for getting things going. Here from John Valley is an attempt to describe the early infall, and the time that we're looking at is the time of that uh, zircon I showed you, where there was indeed water demonstrated present by the zircon somewhere around 4.3 to 4.4 billion years ago. I want hot springs with geysers. Some of the condensation reactions really like uh, high pressures and temperatures, and uh, geysers seem to be the best chance of producing that. Uh, if they even can't do it with their ordinary processes, they probably have shocks that help, help the thing along. I know that there have been some recent experiments which say, well, clay materials in these hot springs grab onto uh, phosphate and they grab on onto many of the other molecules and so wouldn't allow the process to go forward. But I don't know what it was like in this early time. A lot of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. The atmosphere was very different than it is today. I don't know what the materials would have been like or what their behavior was like. It seems to be still the most likely site for something to happen. So what was this wonderful transition from protocell to cell? First of all, we go down the protocell, the energizing was tied to convection, material was just sort of oily stuff scattered by a membrane, held together by dislike of water, the activity, surviving and breaking, growing, dividing, the cycle was carried around by convection, but there also had to be something that formed ribose, and let's guess it was the foremost cycle, and there was no information. The Transition to what it was next it was first, the energizing was first tied to convection, but you had the possibility because there was always a gradient from being, uh, being less oxidative inside the earth to more near the surface that uh, you could have taken advantage of that in the early cells. The material had to be passed through the membrane cohesion was produced by condensation reactions. The activity, instead of growing and dividing, was growing and reproducing. The cycle, there was a cycle that could be developed relatively rapidly to uh, take advantage of putting carbon dioxide together and reducing it and ending up with organic compounds and information stored in nucleic acids. So those seem to be the possible ways. Once life began, much of its next development had to be to acquire its own source of energy to become independent. And it could turn, as I say, to use the reducing power of Earth to turn carbon dioxide to carbon compounds and to start 
fixing nitrogen because the nitrogen was clearly a, a, a rare substance necessary right from the start. It had to survive bombardments, ice ages, chemical changes, and so on. Greatest advances by life, oxygenic photosynthesis and cellular co cooperation. This led to us the chance to take the step beyond intelligence to improve survival for humanity and hopefully for other organisms in the universe. For you to take away, this work is about systems, not chemistry. If you don't like the chemistry, suggest changes. Don't throw out the system baby with the chemistry bath water. Secondly, these processes, fission, metabolism, evolution, exist naturally outside life as well as inside. And evolution, whether genetic or remarkable, occurs by selection. Thank you. Nick, uh, I might mind to start off with the question to you. Um, do you have any reason to suggest that these processes might not occur on a, an early Mars as well as the Earth? You said a few words about it. I still have to start thinking about the application of this elsewhere. It's not obvious that this is the only way that life defined like this could occur, that our kind of life in which we use, use condensation reactions and water uh, could well be just one of the options that life has to develop. That is why uh, I wanted to start here and then move on to thinking about life in the universe in all its various forms. I needed to have this as a, as a first piece uh, it certainly sounds plausible that life might have started this way on Mars just as well as here, but then there are many pieces of the puzzle here that we don't know. I've been talking about, uh, uh, about necessary conditions. What I don't know at all are the sufficient things. What, what is it that you absolutely have to have and that's enough. And so maybe Mars had it, maybe it didn't. Yes. You, you may have addressed this, but, but perhaps I didn't understand. And can you repeat, what is the necessity of water? And is life without water possible? I said what I what I dealt with was a process that developed life on Earth. I I found that condensation reactions seemed to to help solve this ambiguous relationship that water was helpful and water was harmful. Whether there are other substances that can serve instead of this, whether there are ways of totally avoiding this problem, I don't know. I'm too early into this to be able to say that. I certainly would expect that life in some form could exist without water, simply because this process that I went through with my group of friends on the framework showed a further development, which is that, uh, inter how intelligence develops in life and that there's a stage that one can expect beyond the intelligence. And each of these higher stages, just like an empire can start something new, uh, so can the higher development of life start something new. And so a development from us that is a life form totally unconnected to water is totally possible. <coughs> Whether it could start on its own that way, I don't know yet. First, I would like to thank you for this extraordinary lucid exposition, uh, the total layman, I mean awe, of what you just uh, told us. It's the first time I think I understand how I could have started here on the earth. 
Uh, there has been suggestion that um, the, the first life could have started with uh, hydrothermal vents. You prefer the geysers. Can you explain why? Well, yeah. uh, hydrothermal vents, you mean, under the sea. Yeah. And the problem is to get nitrogen there in a fixed form. Uh, nitrogen uh, does get down into hydrothermal vents. It's produced as a result of decay of uh, uh, nitrogen containing molecules in the earth but if you want to fix it in a way that is highly reducing you have a problem with the earth because the earth has been moderately oxygenic right from the start and this is, is a story of the presence of vanadium and chromium uh, oxides in the earth and what they tell then about the amount of, of oxygen that had to be there from the very early days and so it seems unlikely that you can get a sufficiently reducing <coughs> environment to produce the bases and they seem to be absolutely necessary part so i've had to accept the base material came from outside and then it was available at the surface but not in the vents <coughs> hit by something big, maybe twice the size of Mars to make the moon, and maybe evaporate an uh, ocean that buried the whole Earth deeply. And then we acquired later um, ocean, but not covering all land. Now, if you've got a planet in which the entire thing is deeply covered in water, does life have a chance there to begin? The question uh, that you're raising uh, perhaps belongs to discussing Europa, where you're, you have, a, a, if you will, a, a frozen ocean object, and you're asking, could you get the nitrogen compounds there? And, and things were different further out in the solar system. The drivers that tended to produce a more oxidized state were not there. And therefore, it's possible that nitrogen could form its nuclear bases if those were indeed an essential part of the story, despite the fact of being under underwater. I, I'm not sure. There, there are many varieties of, of, of this question you could ask. What about, for example, something like uh, a Uranus object uh, at a temperature rather like that of Earth? Would, what would it do? And all these are fascinating questions. You have to start off by saying, this is why life came to be this way on Earth. What are the fundamental pieces of the development that absolutely had to occur? How could it happen? How could you, for example, get the equivalent of a membrane to break away from material if you were on Titan? All of these things are, are part of a fascinating study which is available to start now. <laughs> but I certainly couldn't get going until I got this one. Uh, I guess a simpleton question. To what do you refer when you speak of the next phase of life being beyond intelligence? I refer to a life which sees uh, processes as an integrated whole. Intelligence is, uh, is a process that we use for specific goals and, uh, and it, it, it resulted in things like the extinction of the large animals of North America, uh, of the birds and plants in Polynesia. It, it has been a terrible process. It has been focused intelligence with only trying to understand our immediate needs. When you try and understand things in an integrated way, you understand the need for having to get, have a complete system working. And your whole 
view of the prophet has to change. I believe that there is a chance for us to develop into that kind of life form, and I sure hope it has developed somewhere else in the universe. Well, you mentioned that nitrogen fixation was a problem. Yes. But isn't it also true that HCN and ammonia are widely distributed throughout the universe? And these are all water-soluble materials. Yes. So why would nitrogen be present in the water to begin with? OK. Um, you're asking, would HCN have been available in solution in the early ocean? That is a. I have to take that one under advice. I certainly haven't thought through in that. It's not the, there are a variety of materials that are present in fairly large amount. HCN is one, uh, and formaldehyde is another, and unfortunately, <coughs> course, they, would, they would tend to cancel one another out and get, take you out of the, the useful range of things. You have to ask how, how nitrogen might become available to processes, whether at that stage we would have had HCN. You remember, uh, as discussed, uh, we, we've been through this monstrous moon-forming catastrophe, which has got rid of an enormous amount of the volatiles from the early Earth. Uh, so the only stuff that we have now is sort of what's been added in. Water crystallization has formed the oceans, and we've had, uh, had carbon dioxide arising from uh, probably carbon-rich materials coming in, getting oxidized on Earth. These, uh, whether the HCN would have been around at that stage is a good question, one I haven't worried about. Hi, just thinking of your two-part definition of life uh, and yes. and considering memory controlled precision assembly on the yes. broadest possible, uh, could you define stars as living by this definition? Stars, uh, stars are dissipative systems. They're somewhat different from the others. They have this wonderful process whereby when one big star is formed, it drives others into forming nearby. There is indeed some of this cyclic processing. There doesn't seem to be a, a memory structure involved that helps, uh, helps it go along. And therefore, I think it forms a, a different uh, class of the, the same genus. But uh, they, they certainly are interesting in, in this way. Uh, I have sort of a statement uh, regarding the water world idea that life could possibly arise in a planet with only water. Yes. I think you have to take into consideration that the dilution property, the dilution is there, because there's so much water compared to organics. So any organics you make, any ammonia you make, anything you make will be so dilute, it would be very unlikely that it could actually life could originate in the bulk water, and then not necessarily it interfaces with the atmosphere or the subterranean surface? That, that is probably uh, the best answer to that. The, um, the problem of dilution is intense in all of these. Two horrible problems, dilution and living with mixtures of material. They're both appallingly difficult for chemistry. I was suggesting that we could perhaps manage to, to uh, bring together materials into, uh, into those uh, hot spring areas, uh, and that, that would, in fact, help very much. Um, once you've got membranes, however, you suddenly change the nature of the problem of dilution, because those are almost like little organisms. They can get carried elsewhere by spray, wind. They can sample various environments, just like microbes do and they hang together. So you have indeed got something that can take advantage of a variety of environments in a way that when you're thinking of just sloshing chemicals around, it's not possible. So it may well be that in fact the early uh, 
proto-life actually needed to move from one environment to another and got carried by air or water to those environments. Can you tell us the, uh, the status of experimental work in the, in the lab that supports the RNA world concept? Uh, it, it sort of in the spirit of uh, Miller, Ori Miller. The, the experimental work essentially has been focused on, nucle uh, on uh, nucleic acids and uh, it, it has changed recently in that people have started taking apart the ribosome and looking at its parts to see how each of the pieces got added on together. Before, they could never, never even uh, imagine the pieces as doing their work separately. So this is very recent. And uh, very recently, uh, equally, as I told you, Rebecca Turk has discovered that you could make an incredibly simple, just five nucleotides stuck together will form an enzyme that can get the process started. Those seem to be absolutely key items. The problem of the RNA world as such is that if you want to try doing this outside of a, a structure, then the RNA is going to interact in other things in ways that you don't want. Uh, it, it doesn't have any structure that's going to preserve it. So there's no way of getting things carried from one generation to the next. It's only when you add in proteins to get structured, like you do for the phages, that you then have a chance of getting evolution to occur. So I'd say it's not so much that the RNA world is an has an experimental problem. It has a theoretical problem right at its base. Yes. Thank you. I just wanted to follow up on, on the, the point about dilution. Yes. Water, oceans. Fundamentally, basically, the polymers of life are unstable in water. Thermodynamically, it's an uphill battle. Membranes don't help because the, the fugacity of the activity of water remains the same inside as outside. So, I, I'm not sure. We are discussing two things somewhat differently. The inside of a membrane is sometimes considered to be the cytoplasm. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking between the bilayer. Uh, well, we can discuss this yes. individually and ourselves. But the, the point is, I think the, the, the the mountain that has to be climbed, and we're talking about life as we know it, by the way, yeah. with regard to life without water, that's, we'll be talking about that too. But the mountain that has to be climbed is a thermodynamic mountain. Yes, absolutely. This is why catalysts, catalysts don't do any good, because all catalysts do is accelerate the rate to equilibrium. Equilibrium favors the monomers, whether it's proteins or nucleic acids. Phosphates, you know, those are esters, phosphate esters, hydrolyzed. So I, I didn't really want to bring this up, but it seems to me that, that, that the, the real difficulty with all of this is the thermodynamic mountain that has to be climbed. And the thermodynamic mountain that has to be climbed is climbed by energy flow and cycles and repetitive behavior and, and that when you get some tiny amount of material produced, if it can be spirited away and preserved from further attack, you will develop more and more and more. Thank you. Um, isn't maybe to climb the thermodynamic mountain, you need a ratchet? You know, uh, something that will only allow movement in the direction that you want and not allow it in the direction you don't want. And that way, you know, you can just wait um, as long as you want until you get fluctuations that happen to be in the direction you want to go and you just reject everything else. Isn't that what you really need to uh, climb that mountain? I wonder whether I've got the words. Yeah, from uh, Jack Mono. Uh, 
Even today, a good many distinguished minds seem unable to accept or even to understand that from the source of noise, natural selection could quite unaided have drawn all the music of the biosphere. That is, he was indeed seeing this possibility that if you can produce it and hang on to it, then you're available for the next step. But we're talking about proto-life. I mean, yes, yes. for life like us, that definitely happens. But what about the proto-life? The difference between proto-life is that you can't preserve it by genes. You have to preserve it by some kind of structure. And there's, I don't think there's any choice. OK, so uh, we've started some interesting discussions. Perhaps you'll uh, join the speaker afterwards for some uh, more in-depth discussions. We have a uh, special set of glass for you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Join me in thanking you.